Our national parks have holes in them. Lots and lots of holes dotted all across the landscape of America's public lands. But you probably won't see them when you visit. In fact, you aren't even allowed to visit them. These aren't holes in the ground, but rather holes on a map. These little holes are called inholdings, and they're essentially tiny islands of private land surrounded entirely by a national park, forest, or just about any other publicly protected area. As of 2015, national parks encompassed some 84 million acres of land in the United States, 2.6 million of which were privately owned. That's 2.6 million acres of privately held land inside our national parks. And that doesn't include our national forests or wildlife refuges, or even your local state parks. Each of those have inholdings of their own, making our public lands look more like Swiss cheese than a unified system of conservation areas. Inholdings can arise in a couple different ways. The most common is simply that the private property was there before the park, and for whatever reason couldn't be acquired when the park was established. This is most common in places where the U.S. government granted private property rights to individuals or corporations. For instance, as early as 1785, individuals could settle land owned by the federal government to live and grow crops on, provided they pay a fee for it. Through subsequent land management legislation, including the Homestead Act of 1862, up to 10% of U.S. land was owned by private individuals by 1934. Of course, these laws completely ignore the fact that these lands had already been occupied by Native Americans for centuries, but that is a story for another video. The outcome of these laws, though, was that U.S. territory was now sprinkled with thousands of individual properties. And when the Homestead Act was repealed in 1976 and unclaimed land could no longer be settled, these private properties were now surrounded by public land. As more of that land started being used for conservation, like parks and forests, these private properties became inholdings. Similar outcomes occurred with federal mining and railroad claims, creating a hodgepodge system where large swaths of federal land were dotted with private property. The other way inholdings can be created is through expansion of parks. In instances where parks are expanded by acquiring adjacent private property, land that isn't acquired can become an inholding. Essentially, by expanding the park, an inholding can be created where it previously didn't exist. And while individual inholdings tend to be relatively small, they can actually have very big implications for how parks are managed. Because they're private property, they're not subject to the rules and regulations of the parks they're located in. Instead, they adhere to local rules and regulations, like a county or city zoning ordinance. Those regulations can be at odds with the management strategy of the park that surrounds them. For instance, take Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It straddles the border between North Carolina and Tennessee. An inholding on the North Carolina side would be subject to North Carolina laws, while an inholding on the Tennessee side would be subject to Tennessee laws, all despite the fact that the park surrounding both of them is subject to federal laws. That administrative boondoggle itself is enough to make life difficult for park managers, but there's no shortage of problems that inholdings cause. Federal law requires that property owners have adequate access to their land, meaning federal resources, and ultimately taxpayer money, must be spent on access roads and other infrastructure to accommodate inholders. Those roads can have adverse impacts on wildlife, cause erosion, increase air and water pollution, and generally fragment the natural landscape. This provision is also quite difficult to enforce in wilderness areas because, well, wilderness areas don't allow motorized vehicles. Building a road through an area that's supposed to have little to no human disturbance makes that virtually impossible. Inholdings can also just make for an unpleasant visitor experience. Coming across a house or some other development in a place you come to for its natural qualities can really put a damper on your visit and runs counter to the mission of our parks in the first place. Or if you stumble upon an inholding without knowing, there's the potential for conflict with a landowner who might not take kindly to trespassers, even those who are doing so accidentally. I think it can actually be helpful to think about inholdings in the context of a city. Think about your house. You wouldn't want a cement plant in your backyard, and the cement plant wouldn't want you as a neighbor either. Those land uses just aren't compatible with one another and make it difficult for everyone involved to get what they want. Each of them needs a different set of rules to fit in with their surroundings. Inholdings are kind of the same way. They're simply incompatible with the thousands of acres of parkland that surround them and require a different set of rules to fit in. 
And these different rules really underlie a simple truth about inholdings. But they just make running a park difficult. Between managing a park's own employees, its visitors, and in some cases millions of acres, park managers have enough on their plate to deal with. The administrative, logistical, legal, and fiscal challenges that come with inholdings simply make that task harder. They divert resources that would otherwise go toward making sure that park or forest is adequately cared for. And in a world where caring for our natural resources is becoming increasingly difficult, giving park managers one less thing to worry about can only be a good thing. So how do we get rid of inholdings? How do we make our protected areas look less like Swiss cheese and more like the unified system of protected land we perceive it to be? That requires an inholding to be closed, and there are several ways to do this. The first is our good friend, the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Now, I made a whole video about the LWCF, how it works, why it's important, all that good stuff, and you can check that out down below if you're interested. But basically, one of the main ways the LWCF is used is to close inholdings. It uses royalties from offshore oil and gas leases to fund inholding acquisitions, meaning it doesn't cost taxpayers anything to do so. There are also private and nonprofit groups involved in buying inholdings. Land trusts or other conservation entities can negotiate with landowners to buy their property before holding it as a conservation easement or donating it to the park in which it was located. Either way, it is prevented from being developed. Of course, landowners can also donate their inholding either to a land trust or the park itself. They can also swap it for a piece of federal land not within the park boundary. Either way, this closes the inholding and again keeps the land from being developed. In very rare instances, inholdings may be acquired through eminent domain or condemnation. This process is extremely controversial and generally requires congressional approval, so it isn't used often. Overall though, inholdings are one of the many complex issues facing our public lands. They're a product of centuries of settlement overlaid with only a relatively new conservation ethos. And they can make things quite interesting when it comes to protecting our parks. The different rules and regulations they abide by are often at odds with the core mission of our parks and protected areas. By closing them, we ensure those areas stay protected for future generations to come. If you want to learn more about the world's protected places, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. It helps me bring more park stories to more people. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.